Okay, so how many of you like bananas? I love them, honestly. It's like, it's definitely a superfood and so well balanced. But the question is, where do you get your bananas? Now, if you've been to the US, you know that you can find bananas in any superstore and they have this lovely bright blue sticker on them a lot of the times. If you haven't been to the US, that's okay. Just Google bananas in the US and definitely a photo will pop up with that beautiful blue sticker. And that would say Chiquita, potassium, yum yum. How cute, right? But the funny thing is, as you can already guess by the title of the video, these cute little bananas have a very, very dark past. These stems are very heavy and usually weigh anything between 80 to 100 pounds. Beneath this seeming chaos lies a plan of order almost military in its precision. The loading goes on day and night at a terrific speed. As time is money, the ship must be in the shortest possible time. And you'd be thinking like, okay, even if it did have a dark past, what does it matter? Well, it's not that just the bananas have a dark past. It's the fact that these bananas ruined the lives of millions of people and ruined their countries as well. And given the state of the world today, it's very possible that a lot of us live in countries where similar things are happening, either through corporations, through other entities, and we don't know what's going on because we haven't read or learned about the same things that have happened in the past. That's exactly why I'm making this video. Now, this company Chiquita, if you look it up, it's all sorts of adorable. I mean, their website is so playful and colorful. And it says in their own words that Chiquita is a brand that infects happiness, positivity, and the desire to share. And it does give a nice little brief history about its company. The brand Chiquita, which also now includes the brand Fifis, was once called the United Fruit Company. And it's from there that we'll begin the dark history of bananas. Hi, my name is Misha and welcome to Tariki Tales. Make sure to like, share, subscribe. I mean, seriously, share this with all the people who love eating bananas because they should be buying bananas, definitely. But maybe go to the farmer's market or go to the places that don't have this taboo of ruining the lives of so many people. So our story begins in the 1880s with a man named Andrew Preston. And he saw great potential in this fruit that was coming in from the Caribbean and it was called the banana. So he joined hands with another company which was based in Boston. It was called the Boston Fruit Company. And together they evolved into the United Fruit Company. And they began a large scale operation where they wanted to control everything about this plant. They wanted to control the production, the logistics, the supply chain, and the selling of it. Hence, maximizing profits from everywhere possible. Now this company that I talked about earlier, the Boston Fruit Company and Andrew Preston, also had a railway company that kind of joined the coalition. Now to kind of understand exactly how they were working, let's break it down. First, let's talk about the production end of things. How did they manage to produce bananas on a scale so large that they control such a huge chunk of the banana market worldwide, even today? Now, the number one technique was to basically cut deals with developing countries and acquire insanely huge amounts of land. Countries such as Costa Rica, Honduras and Guatemala made such deals, which said that the Boston Fruit Company, because it has a railway company in it, would build infrastructure throughout the country, such as railroads and ports, to help the country kind of flourish economically. And in turn, land would be granted to the company along with tax exemptions. And initially, a lot of the countries thought that, wow, this is such a good deal because our countries are going to flourish because of the help of the United Fruit Company. It'll be a mutually beneficial kind of a thing. But the thing is, that was never their intent. They took the land, they took the tax exemptions, but they systematically made sure that whatever infrastructure they built does not actually help the locals because they don't want the locals to get autonomy from them. In countries such as Guatemala, they actually got a lot of land given to them through dictators which were backed by the US. And no, we're not just saying this, there are actual CIA documents that have been released over the years that kind of show us exactly how that has been done. By 1950s, 
42 percent of all land in Guatemala was basically owned by the United Fruit Company. And that included more than half of all the agricultural land in Guatemala, thus making the country heavily dependent on the United Fruit Company for jobs as well as for the production of food. The company made sure to keep their banana plantations running by using racial differences among the working groups and using them against each other. They employed people from a number of different races and pitted them against one another. This made sure that their focus is divided and they don't get together and turn against the company. The structure that they followed was that the American white men would get the most prestigious jobs, obviously, like managers and financial advisors. Anyone of color would be doing hard physical labor. They also made strict distinctions between Hispanics and West Indian workers. What they did was that if they awarded one ethnic group, they would tell the rest of them that, well, they worked harder than you and they did better than you. And if any of the groups was actually punished, then they would tell the group that you're punished because the other groups also did this mistake. And that's why you're also getting punished. And this kind of fostered feelings of animosity and hatred between the workers themselves. The working conditions were also quite bad. There were few labor laws. And even if there were labor laws, the United Fruit Company actually had provisions saying that within their domain, their laws are which are applicable, not the country's laws. So they had a lot of spine to go ahead and do such things and they were able to do these things because the dictators in some countries would allow such things to happen because their pockets were being filled. And they worked really hard to make sure that none of this goes back to the US because that's where they want to sell their bananas. So because in the early 1900s, banana was a very new fruit. People didn't know much about it. They needed to market it to the people in the US. So their marketing campaigns began somewhere around 1917. And during that time, it was largely believed that marketing and ads should be targeting the rationale of people because that was basically the trend in marketing. So Taking a cue from that, the United Fruit Company started to hire a lot of scientists and researchers and they would churn out There were a lot of such scientific articles coming out about bananas during that time. And the thing is that researchers today have found that, okay, yes, bananas are definitely healthy. But some of the metrics that the articles from 1917 era talk about, they're impossible to be even measured during that time. So a lot of the articles were actually fabrication because people were being paid off. That's why I say I don't believe every study that comes out because a lot of the studies are subliminal marketing. It's happening even today. I mean, that's why I feel like history is so important because once you learn about all the things that have happened in the past, you just realize how much more of these things must be happening today and we just don't know about it. And the Americans completely bought into this research and the banana sales started to rise. But the sales were still not as much as the United Fruit Company wanted. So during the 1920s, they brought in a guy called Edward Bernays. And now this guy, he was a propagandist. He had figured out that targeting people's emotions made them flock towards the product and it worked so much better than rational thought. And the reason this company brought him in was because he had previously worked his magic with women and cigarettes. Cigarette companies wanted women to start smoking. And Edward Bernays was the guy that basically got a cigarette in the hands of every woman in America during that time. So naturally, the UFC decided that this is the kind of marketing they want. And under the leadership of Edward Bernays, they launched an entire fleet of ships called the Great White Fleet. And these ships would sail American citizens to the UFC-controlled countries, which also became known as Banana Republics, by the way. Costa Rica, Honduras, Guatemala. And they were targeting American middle-class people. They wanted these people to kind of feel the fantasy of going to this distant land. They were romanticizing it as much as they could, including adding things like pirates and whatnot in these posters, saying that this is the land where pirates hid their gold. A thousand miles south of New Orleans, the blue waters of the Caribbean break upon the shores of Central America. For many years, these fascinating tropical countries have been served by United Fruit Company's Great White Fleet. 
These lands are principally agricultural, and their combined population is actually less than the population of New York. People would churn out huge sums of money for these cruise tickets. They became very popular, and in turn, banana sales would also start to rise. And one more thing that happened was that they were able to fool the American public with this stunt, because during these cruises, when they would visit the islands, the UFC told them that you know what, we'll take you and show you the plantations, and we'll show you how well we treat our workers. And people were like. People were all for it, so people were in fact taken to plantations. But the plantations they were taken to were not the real deal. These were basically sets which were carefully curated, and the workers that worked there were also trained actors who would be taught to kind of show that they're working in a warm, healthy, good environment, and they're very happy. Bananas are planted in holes a foot deep and 15 to 18 feet apart. Where every bunch is washed and inspected before leaving the plantation. And again, this sold. The American people believed that wow, this company is so good. They're taking care of all these poor people from these poor countries, and they're making bananas. So let's buy bananas. And banana sales skyrocketed. So we see that the production and the marketing bit are kind of all set. You know, the United Fruit Company understood exactly how to do those too. But sometimes there were upsets. There were issues that would come up during this production and all of this because. What they were doing was oppressing entire countries. They wanted to make sure that these systems kept running smoothly, and they went to great lengths for this. One very good example of exactly how dangerous this company was is found in the case of Guatemala, where after years of dictatorships, finally a democratically elected president. Came into power, Jacobo Arbenz, and Arbenz wanted to carry out land reforms. He wanted to distribute lands. He wanted to buy back the lands from the United Fruit Company and distribute it to local farmers, so that the economy can grow and people have enough food. Because at that point in time, Guatemala was doing so badly, and his policies were actually definitely going to help the country. But the United Fruit Company realized that his policies will be taking away all the land that they had grasped over time. So what they did. Was that in order to get him off? And he was a very, very popular leader in Guatemala. Like people loved him. And in order to get him out of the way, they went as far as to involve the U.S. president. They involved the CIA, and they actually used the skills of that guy, Edward Bernays. They carried out this entire mission, and they branded him as a communist. And an article after article would be coming out in the U.S. talking about his communist ideas and how he's going over to the side of Russia. And because during that time the Cold War was going on in the background between the U.S. and the USSR, the CIA got involved and they started an operation. First, it was called PB Fortune. Then it was called PB Success. There are actual documents released by the CIA which show details of these operations. And the CIA, together with the United Fruit Company plan an entire coup in the country. Guatemala was invaded by its own military, and the balance of power was shifted. Jacobo Arbenz was taken off, and a dictatorship put in place. I have another detailed video about this actual, the entire Guatemalan thing. I'll link it up here somewhere. It's very fascinating when you once you get into the nitty gritties as to how much they did just for money, how many people's lives they ruined, and how badly. It affected Guatemala, and I think everybody listening to the video can kind of link a lot of these things happening in their own countries at some points. And this is not a one-off thing. This has happened in other countries. The CIA actually made this into a model. They have documents talking about how the Guatemalan case can be used and replicated in other countries where they need things to go in their own way, and they can move away these democratically elected people by paying off other people and doing coups and. While all this happened, they tried to make sure that it looked like a local uprising, that no foreign powers are involved. 
Okay. Today, the United Fruit Company is called Chiquita and Fifes, and it controls more than 29% of the banana market. This is more share than any other one company has within this domain. So the fact that they were able to do all of this and then rebrand it to Chiquita, and even today you can find their bananas in the U.S. market, says a lot about the world that we live in. And there's a lot about how much we need to look into things before we buy them because where is the money being used is a big question. So next time you go to the grocery store in the US, think about which bananas you're going to buy. And I will see you guys next time. Bye.